It was almost a hundred years ago to the day that Christians around the globe needed the first Christ the King Sunday. Think back to the 1920s. None of you can, of course. But think back to that era. It was a very disturbing time. And Christians needed a Sunday set apart to reflect on how the lordship of the cosmic Christ trumps all other dictators and kings. That Christ's lordship is more powerful than the worst dictators. So, it became a day to remember that Christ is a different kind of ruler with a different kind of reign, hopeful, loving, and powerful. And no other king had ever done that before. Pope Pius XI looked out at a world in which, okay, Mussolini at that time, the 1920s, had been a leader of Italy for three years, a despot, a despicable, violent king. Uh, Adolf Hitler had just published his autobiographical uh, book, Mein Kampf, a despicable king, yes. And the frivolity of the economics of the day led the world into a depression, both economically, but also, perhaps more importantly, psychologically depressed. Okay? Uh, does this sound familiar, by the way, to today's world? Who says the Bible isn't current on events? Pope Pius looked out at this world, and bearing witness to Christ, he announced a new liturgical festival, Christ the King. And he did so to remind Christians that we already have a king to whom we owe our allegiance and to no other king. That's how Christ the King came about. So we've had it on our Lutheran liturgical calendar. It's been around 100 years. And that's the thing about Christians. We like to focus on Christ. Of course, it's part of the Blessed Trinity, a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, and Encourager. But it is in Christ and his face on earth that we see the glory of God's love and God's reign of love. And so we focus on Christ. Well, and thank you so much, Randy, for emphasizing certain things, a little prelude to what I'm preaching on, and we hadn't even talked. Um, first lesson, Daniel, that old prophet, ended up where? I believe in a lion's den. You know, prophets did not have an easy life. I saw one like a human being descending from the clouds of heaven. I wonder who that like a human being was. And he came to the ancient one, that's a euphemism for God, and he was present, presented before God, and here it is. Wait for it. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship. Now, I should preface this by saying we sometimes have trouble with the word king today, and rightly so. It's a different world than the patriarchal world that the biblical writers wrote in. However, I'm preaching from these texts, so I'm going to use it. But you could just as soon substitute the reign of Christ. Or if I were the Pope, I would have uh, announced a different holiday. I would have announced the holiday of the cosmic Christ. Anyway, we're stuck with king. It's all right, because what we find out in Christ the king is probably even more important for Christians to remember because the whole point of Christ the King is to show how he is not like other kings. You know how you teach kids sometimes? The way you teach them is you say, here's what not to do. Here's what a king ought not to do. And here's what a king ought to do. That's the point of Christ the King, see? Oh, and the seer, John of Patmos, who wrote the Apocalypse, Revelation, says... Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come. That's the ancient one, God. And from the seven spirits. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. It has precedent in the Bible, you see. But we should remember, this king is a strange one. And that's why people don't immediately climb onto him. 
Um, his rule of self-sacrifice does not make a political slogan very popular, right? Uh, lose your life in order to gain it. Have you heard that by any of the political presidential candidates? No. Remember, as I said once to you, the Christian church is a unique organism. It doesn't take its cue from the left or the right or even in a center. It takes its cue from him alone, Christ, the face of Almighty God. And that's where we owe our allegiance, see? Okay, well, he's, he's odd. We like him and we don't. I'm just going to be honest. I'm speaking for myself. I like Jesus, and I don't like him. When he calls me to pick up my cross, for example, it would be nice to live in a little more luxury, Jesus. Pick up the cross? Well, he's not pulling any punches. Pick it up, he said. I'll be with you. Um, we, we want to serve him, but we often do it kicking and screaming. And finding other things to do. There's a concert. No, there's good. Concerts are good. There's a concert this afternoon. Uh, there's a football game. There we go. <laughs> Is there a football game? <laughs> I don't watch sports. Okay. Well, you're going to sing this. The oddity and the paradox of this king. You, Lord, are both lamb and shepherd. How can you be a lamb and a shepherd? You can in the paradox of the mystery of God. You, Lord, are both prince and slave. You, peacemaker and sword bringer. He said both. On one occasion he said, I come to bring peace. On another occasion he said, I come to bring a sword. Now, let's remember, it wasn't a physical sword, it was a metaphor for cutting through all the baloney, or Luther had another word for it. That's what the sword in Jesus' mouth is, is to cut through all the baloney. See? Uh, worship, worthy is our earthly Jesus. You'll be singing this. Worthy is our cosmic Christ. Earthly, cosmic. It's a paradox. Worthy still your peace. Wait, worthy your defeat and victory. That's it, right there. That's the paradox. Defeat and victory, both in the Holy Cross. Worthy still your peace and strife. You see all these juxtapositions of the opposites are all in this strange king, Jesus. Okay, I just thought I'd bring up that music because the hymn is so wonderful that our music people picked out. Okay. I knew from an early age Jesus had given his heart to me and to you and to the whole world. He embraced us, and I wanted to embrace him back, and I did, and I do. But I still think he's strange. I'm drawn to him, and I'm repelled by him. Um, with the spit still on his face from the crowd, with the trickles of blood coming down his temple from the mocking crown of thorns, he stands in front of Pilate. And this has bothered me since I first heard about it in third grade. I remember my Sunday school teacher. How could Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, my Lord and Savior, have to stand and be interrogated by this puppet governor who was, he was scared out of his wits because he had to kowtow to Herod, and then to Tiberius, all the way back to Julius Caesar Augustus. That's how it works with bad kings. They tell you what to do. You kill people because it's just collateral damage. And uh, Jesus, the lover of all people, is having to answer to Pilate, who was ruthless, by the way, if you read, his, uh, read about his life. But I want to say this, and it's a theory of mine, just a theory. I think because I want it to be, to be true, that Pilate secretly, maybe, admired Jesus. Uh, he did wash his hands, after all. He did, want, he did talk to Jesus. He didn't just throw the book at him, although eventually he did, a coward that he was. But I want to believe that there was something about him that saw something in Jesus that he liked but didn't understand. Maybe like all of us, see? Before we vilify him too much, which I've already done. 
I think we're all on this journey. Are you a king, Pilate asked Jesus, who's standing all but naked in front of him, bleeding. Doesn't look like a king. And Jesus answered, that's what you say. <laughs> it's so typical of Jesus' provocative words. And I take that to mean he was turning the tables on Pilate and making Pilate realize he was completely soaked in the cultural understandings of kingship of his day. And it was hard for him to imagine a different kind of king. It was hard for anyone to imagine a different kind of king, see? Um, Jesus continued, I am a king, but not from here. Not from this world. Not from these expectations of a king. My power is different. Because if it weren't so, you'd be crushed already, Pilate, <laughs> by my angels' armies and their missiles. I added missiles. No, his power wasn't from here at all. He didn't fit the idea of kingship. Well, what does it mean then that Christians could eventually want to call Jesus king? The one who didn't ride in a chariot, he walked. The one who didn't carry a spear, he had a walking stick. The one who didn't, you know, have elaborate food, a pocket full of pita bread in his undergarments so he could eat on his journey. Why do we want to call him king? Um, where was his royal entourage? Where were the expensive dinners? Where were the sycophants, you know, all vying for power so they could be part of the inner circle? No, he wasn't interested in their titles, in their wealth, in their degradation of human beings. He wasn't interested in Julius Caesar Augustus. He wasn't interested in Tiberius Caesar, the one that, under whose tutelage he was killed. He wasn't interested in Herod, Pilate, or any other king then or now, who practices hate and division. And that's how kings mostly operate in the history of the world. They live by division and hate. And we heard it by the bucketful during this election. Division and hate. Now, Jesus isn't interested in that, but he is interested in you. Just as you are, the way you are, Fickle sometimes, if you're like me. Strong sometimes. And he's interested in everybody the same way, see? That's the kind of king he is. No king does that in the history of the world, but Jesus does. And he even calls you friends. The king calls you a friend. And the king actually gives you a co-worker designation in the kingdom. You're to work with him. What well, says that in one of the lessons? to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, here it is, priest serving God and Father. That's the kind of king Jesus is. Now, some of you have heard of Rachel Held Evans. Uh, she was a recovering fundamentalist Christian. I uh, have two of her books I love. She died way too early, before she was 40, I think. She was a Christian blogger. She cut through stuff like Jesus does, and she brought in the gospel, the good news, the joy of life in Christ. Get a book of hers. She's got eight of them. I, long ago, I, I loved this quote, and I cut it out with scissor out of a book <laughs> that I later gave to someone else, and they called me on it. <laughs> and I put it in a, on a piece of paper, and I got it right here. Here's what Rachel Evans says. What I love about the ministry of Jesus is that he identified the poor as blessed, and get this, and the rich as needy. Oh, here's the strangeness of Jesus, the upside-down kingship that he brought into the world, which was all along the blessed Trinity's dream for the world. All along. And he brought it. You remember, it was one of the first things he said in the Gospel of Mark, the first Gospel written. The kingdom of God is here among you in me today. And it has been all these centuries, sometimes just a little fledgling group, but it's been there all along, see? Well, 
Jesus came to fulfill the truth of these old geezers, these prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They did some strange things too. Um, but he was brought to this earth to also share the psalmist's yearnings. And this, what I'm going to read from you is a little segment from Psalm 146. It can be multiplied about 300 times in the book of Psalms. You know it. Do not put your trust in kings, in mortals in whom there is no help. Happy are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. And here it comes. Who executes justice for the oppressed. What king in history has made that his program? Maybe a couple. I'm not a historian. I'm a, an aspiring historian. But mostly, you know, 98.8% are not like this. Who gives food to the hungry. And now this part is my favorite. Psalm 146. The Lord God sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. Here's a little aside. When King David, powerful King David, uh, rode into Jerusalem for the first time to see his new kingdom, he met blind people at the Pool of Siloam. You know what he did to them? He had them killed. Did you know that? Little, little known fact. Most people who love to talk about King David don't know that fact. He had them killed because they were worthless. They were not helpful for his kingdom. A, a kingdom that's going to look really good. Shouldn't have blind people. But what did Jesus do? Oh, I'm trying to remember. When he first came into Jerusalem at the Pool of Siloam, he healed the blind. What king do you want to live under? David or Jesus? Now we can multiply that all the way across the board. Well, here we are, post-election 2024. I will say to you, my sisters and brothers, I am worried about the future. I'm not here to tell anybody who to vote for. We don't do that. But I can share with you what pastors are ordained to tell you, and that's the gospel, the truth about God's love and the truth about the way we're supposed to live. And I'm going to do that. i got a few guts left. Okay, we're a very fractured country. Or as my wonderful scientist friend who teaches at Stanford posted this week, see if you can relate, my desire to be informed is currently at odds with my desire to remain sane. <laughs> I gave her a thumbs up. Amen. Can we not all agree with that? I am wearied by junk news. And may I say as a suggestion only, turn off the news for a while. It's a dance because we want to be informed as Christians, but you don't want to get all in the hot bucket of the stupidity of flashy, shiny news, which means practically nothing, uh, except for the gullible. Um, so what do we do? What would the Messiah, what would Christ, the upside-down king, to whom we owe our allegiance, what would he have us do? Well, I made up four things. <laughs> Number one, be good to each other, especially the one who voted different than you. You got him in your family. No, I, that's not easy to do. I'm just saying, because I said this for myself. Number one, Tom, be good to your cousin. <laughs> and I'm trying it. It's a journey, but I think that's important. We don't need more division. Now, being good to someone who voted different than you doesn't mean you're a doormat, and it doesn't mean you don't have your own opinion. It means you listen to them to remain in relationship as Christ did to all people. The good, the bad, the rich, the poor, the healed, the unhealed. He, he loved them all. We owe our allegiance to him alone, see? Now, it's easier said than done. You can talk to someone. Listen to them and then share your understanding of Christ. That's all you have to do. Say, oh, I, thank you, Jerry. I, now I know a little bit more about you. It's a deep subject. I, I take my uh, cue from, from Christ. Well, I'm a Christian. Yeah. And I take it from Christ, too, who loved the whole world, who was out in the margins with the poor and the destitute, who cared for the orphans and widows and all this stuff. 
just see where it goes. I left it there, and it, there was a long pause. <laughs> That's okay. All right, number one, be good to people. Number two, go back and reread the words of Jesus. That's in the Gospels. Read the four Gospels. Better yet, next week starts a new church year. This is the last Sunday of this church year. And the next church year starts Advent 1. What's happening here on Advent 1? You're a brand new pastor. Pastor J.T. Burke is going to be installed. I'll be here with the joy of it all. Why don't you, like if you were to take this assignment from me, read the Gospel of Luke starting this week and read the entire Gospel. If you did it in one sitting, it would take you 40 minutes. But read snippets, especially Luke 6 through 8, the Sermon on the Plain. These are the words of Jesus. These are the cue we take for our Christian lives. And then when Pastor JT is preaching, <coughs> starting Advent 1 on Luke, you can go up to him afterwards and say, by the way, Pastor, I've been reading in the Gospel of Luke in preparation for the sermons. <laughs> He'll be impressed. Oh, isn't that joyful? That's fun. I read that, Pastor JT. And I have a question about it. Well, pastors love that. Are you kidding? <laughs> Number three, uh, follow him in new ways. By the way, as long as you claim to have Christ as your king, you have no right, nor do I, to jettison his words. I talked to a Christian nationalist once about the Sermon on the Mount. She didn't know what it was. I said, some of the words she said, oh, that stuff. Well, we found out that's weak. That doesn't work. Now, so much for Christian nationalism. There's nothing Christian about it, by the way. Nothing. It's all political. Okay, uh, following him, brand new baby steps. Uh, orphans, widows, strangers, the immigrant. Find ways to follow Jesus, your upside-down, beautiful king in this world. And... Uh, Another quote from Rachel Evans. You'll be reading her book soon. Imagine if every church became a place where everyone is safe, but no one is completely comfortable. You think we're supposed to be comfortable with every word Jesus says? I'm not. Imagine if every church became a place where we told one another the truth. And then I added here my words, with humility, not hubris. You don't get anywhere if you say, I'm going to tell you the truth. You voted wrong. Yeah, you lost it right there, out of the hack. With humility, see. We might just create sanctuary. And finally, this is the gospel because we know we don't do this perfectly. I found this quote from Father Capon. Uh, where is it? It's back here. All right. So that you don't beat yourself up over this because it's challenging. Uh, and I don't know where any of us are on that reaching in and listening to someone who is different from us. Um, Father Capon wrote, All the while, Christian, there was one thing we most needed even from the start and certainly will need from here on on into the new Jerusalem and a time. The ability to take our freedom in Christ seriously and act on it. To live not in fear of mistakes, but in the knowledge that no mistake can hold a candle to the love that draws us home. There you are. You can risk it. You're held in his arms forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>